Hmm. So this is an end of the year video and it's a video of thanks to YouTube and to whoever's watching. Uh, it's because of the things that you've done YouTube as a whole and specific individuals upon YouTube who say I'm subscribed to that this particular something I have to offer you back is so important to me because I know it should be important to you too or, or it might be what am I going to do I'm going to show you two pieces of information one of which you're going to if, if you want to verify it yourself you're going to have to go looking for it but I would Caution you in advance to be careful at how you weight the information you find when if if and when you do find it and to not jump to hasty conclusions because of the context in which you find it. It's rarely on the internet going to be in the context con context you expect to find it unless you have some kind of specialist access to where you can find less filtered information, more raw information. And that's the particular reason why I've decided to set this video to private for a short period of time. So it's set to private for now. There might be some discussion in a discussion threads below, like in the comments below, I don't know. I'm enabling comments, but here's the important part. First piece of information comes from a number one bestseller from back in the 1970s. A number one bestseller, this particular book, and I'm reading a second, second edition, I believe. The low price Bantam book has been completely reset in a typeface designed for easy reading and was printed from new plates. It contains the complete text, the original hardcover edition. Not one word has been omitted. So they did a double printing probably. Oh, McKay edition, the hardcover 1971. This Bantam edition, 73, second printing, third printing, fourth printing, fifth printing. Copyright 1971 by Ladislas Farago, The Game of the Foxes. I had picked up this book a long time ago and I hadn't got around to finishing reading it. Picked it up at a bookstore that no longer exists. Apparently, the last time it was date stamped was in 2001. I got it for $1. About the author. Ladislas Frago, born in Hungary and educated there, lived in Berlin and London before, before becoming an American citizen and settling in New York City. His first book was published in 1935 and since then... He has written numerous books, mostly in the areas of military affairs and espionage, and been published in both the U.S. and in Europe. He has a number of bestsellers to his credit, and several of his books have been major book club, club selections. His recent books include Patton, upon which the award-winning movie was based, The Broken Seal, and The Game of the Foxes. The movie Tora 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 is also based upon one of Mr. Farrago's books. Consider one of the better tellings of that story, Torah, Torah, Torah. In addition to his books, Ladislas Farago has written for newspapers and magazines, both Europe and the U.S., served with U.S. Naval Intelligence and been a desk chief for Radio Free Europe. He's also been a frequent reviewer for the New York Times Book Review and other book media. You can take Ladislas Farago, Farago at your own estimation and credit. I, I won't say anything else pro or con against him. I merely mean to use him as the major source for this information, which otherwise I hadn't encountered anywhere. A fox went out on a hungry plight and he begged of the moon to give him light from an old folk tale. I get to the, I get to the reference. Hey, before I do in the back, there's a bibliography of his sources. They're really, really cool. It's really cool. Primary sources, guides, bibliographies, and, summa and summary sheets. He has the benefit of the Nuremberg trials and everything that followed afterward. Published documents and official publications as well. It's incredible. Plus, in the index, in the index, the names of all the people involved, at least as far as he could run them down. And when you go under the name, or if you go under the letter P in the index, and you go down the list, to the P.O.'s, the very top of the P.O. list, 
is Podesta Luigi. Page number 470. Hertzlet carried Davis's Dunning letter to the Goering. Okay. In short, unionized labor was a going concern in 1940 for the re-election of FDR. Some of FDR's greatest uh, opposition came from unionized labor. However, unionized labor was dealing with the Germans at the time. Davis now asked Hertzlet, in the wake of the UM, UMW convention, Lewis confided Robert Kintner, who was then writing a syndicated column with Joseph Alsop, some of the features of his activities. He told Kintner that he had turned against Roosevelt and was backing Senator Wheeler for the Democratic presidential nomination, that he had more than a million dollars in the bank to be put on Wheeler, quote unquote and that he had already shifted the railroad, railroad Brotherhood and Dan Tobin, head of the Teamsters, quote, one of the roughest branches of the whole labor movement away from FDR. Davis now asked Hertzlet to transfer, to arrange the transfer of the German share of the campaign funds, quote, unquote, soon as possible, suggested that Hertzlet join him in the U.S., despite his previous failure to do so. Hertzlet carried Davis's Dunning letter to Goering, what with the acute shortage of foreign currency in the German exchequer, it needed much of the field marshal's considerable ingenuity to scrape up the money for financing the plot. He did not have anything like a hundred thousand or a yeah, hundred thousand, sorry, a hundred million dollars, which he thought would be needed either to elect or defeat a presidential candidate. He was in fact apprehensive of the entire scheme might fail because it would be underfinanced. But he managed to scrape up $5 million from his various secret funds and place it at the disposal of Davis and Hertzlet. There was an anticipated need for $100 million U.S. currency in order to swing the election against Roosevelt. He only, managed, he only wanted to provide or only managed to scrape up $5 million from his various secret funds, Goering was an enormous sum. At about the same time, only $50,000 in a special fund was appropriated for the German embassy in Washington when the foreign ministry decided that Dr. Hans Thompson, the charge d'affaires, should undertake a similar anti-Roosevelt campaign. As we shall see, the embassy's fund proved too little and the millions Goering gave Davis too much. Even today, with all the details of the plot are available in the documents, this multi-million dollar campaign fund, quote-unquote, remains the only mysterious feature of this conspiracy. Hertzlet insisted after the war that Goering had raised it, that it was taken to the United States by a trusted Italian courier named Luigi Podesta, and that Podesta had turned it over to Davis, who deposited in various accounts the First National Bank of Boston, Irving Trust Company in New York, Bank of America in San Francisco and the Banco Germana, Banco Germano, Banco Germano, I guess, Hermano, in uh, Mexico City. But Herzlitt did not profess to know how the money was used, how much of it was spent, what became of the remainder. He conceded merely that the anti Roosevelt campaign had swallowed up only a fraction of that sum. It became possible for Davis, he said, to conduct the campaign in a shoestring because. He had the trump card in his deck and expected to win the game with it alone. It was John L. Lewis. Podesta is only mentioned in that transaction as an Italian courier. It drifts out of the tail. Hey, I went looking online. See what I could find out if I went looking for the name Luigi Podesta. Would you know, wouldn't you know, wouldn't you know. Private Law 156. Chapter 236, I am a little bit mystified here. I'm a Canadian. I don't understand this stuff. That's why I've kept it private for a little while. July 19, 1951. Uh, there's a reference number there as well. S879. An act for the relief of Luigi Podesta. Quota deduction. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled. Gee, that sounds like a pretty obvious title for whose law this is, private law or otherwise. 
that for the purposes of the immigration and naturalization laws, Luigi Podesta shall be held and considered to have been lawfully admitted to the U.S. for permanent residence as of this date, as of the date of the enactment of this act, upon payment of the required visa fee and head tax, upon the granting of a permanent residence to such an alien as provided for in this act, the Secretary of State shall instruct the proper quota control officer to deduct one number from the appropriate quota for the first year that such quota is available, approved July 19, 1951, quota deduction marked over there. And so it makes perfect sense what happened here, how it bureaucratically fits into what happens in that time. It falls right to the Secretary of State to have to do this. It's funny, the thing is that, you know, like this name, right? The name is what stands out. And it would have to be someone who was not up to that point a United States citizen, correct? I only got to thinking about this again because QAnon. That's the only reason. Who would have been old enough to have helped arrange for this? And could this have also come, come attached with a certain amount of wiggle room in terms of changing one's identity? So, I'm going to email this to specific people. And I'm, not, I'm going to wait for them to tell me what to do with this particular video in terms of how to, when to put it up online. But I find that compelling. If anyone wants to run with that ball, with that particular little bit of information and coin, the coin that it is, the coin that it is, consider it my gift back to you. <laughs> I, I'll tell you how I came upon this. I went looking for it through a regular type of what is essentially a Google search. I was curious though, and I did use Google, and this came back to me from a Google book scan. So this is one of those books, I guess in, in like the Library of Congress or something, that got totally scanned and put online. That's what I can read in it now. I can see that it's private law. I can understand that much. What's curious is the name. And, and actually what my head does is start to put together maybe what might have happened in the meantime. Suppose, for example, that Luigi the Courier got whipped up when a lot of the other German spies got whipped up not that long after. It's possible that through the connections that were understood, certainly they knew about the, the money that was in banks and the, and the like. But anyhow... They knew about what money was went, went in some of the banks and stuff. He mentioned it in the book there. He also got character assassinated. I mean, Ladislas Frago. Well, depending on who he was working for. But yeah, uh, Luigi. If he ends up in incarcerated, if he ends up incarcerated as an enemy combatant for a short period of time, say eight to ten years, but he doesn't need to go and gen pop. He's totally controlled asset now. We got people who are ready to use him against the enemy if we so to desire. Plus he came attached with like five million of five million bucks. When? Especially if you know the right people. And that's and and for that matter, he was trusted enough that he got a, he, well, we weren't at war with Italy at that time, but it was coming. So uh, I'll email it to you. Yeah, it totally belongs in the cults 101 file. Thank you for watching. <laughs>